I've worked a few odd jobs in my life. My first job was a summer job at 16 during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and it made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job but the following summer I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church and my sister had attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time her health had begun to take a hit as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in a few exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her story seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry as well as help prep her photos with minor touching up and the addition of her company watermark before uploading them to a site where her customers could browse them and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium, and cross-country jumping and for the first several months my job stayed in her living room, which was basically my office space at the time. Eventually I was talked into tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie, I'm not a horse person, but things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons, one who was out of state and the other who was in the navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nate, I had only heard small things about. He was somewhere on the autism spectrum, but she was never clear on what exactly his diagnosis was. She believed firmly he was vaccine injured and that all his oddities could be traced back to vaccines. When he finally returned home, I met him for the first time while working in her living room. He seemed like a nice guy. A little odd, but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies, and being a bit of a movie buff myself, Whenever he would venture to the living room and strike up a conversation, it would always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to see. I should point out here that I was only 18 by this point and he was in his mid-30s. At some point, he got it in his head that I was interested in him, and though he never said anything directly to me, I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as a secretary at her church and Nate knew it. I can only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nate showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about me. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to his church and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, as was the pastor who happened to overhear it, and when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to lead him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I got even more uncomfortable around him when I overheard a conversation between himself and my boss in the next room. He was talking about his experience in the Navy while she was talking about the dangers of Islam. At one point he said in a completely serious tone, If I had it my way, I'd just shoot and kill any Muslim I met. Problem solved. My boss simply laughed the comment off like it was nothing, and something in his tone really creeped me out. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and kept the conversation short while stressing I had work to do. Eventually he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, and my boss's company had closed and I was working someplace new. I was friends with both my boss and Nate on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do when I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram because she didn't know what a pentacle was and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol, but that also paganism has nothing to do with Satan anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nate telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. 
Eventually he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked him and her, deciding I was done with both of them. Then he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he showed up there too. This time I told the managers outright who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. During one of those many encounters while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer while both of us heard Nate shouting in our direction. I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them, and they told him his business was no longer welcome there. They stopped showing up at my other job as well for a while, which was a relief. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or check the parking lot for his truck. Then one day, he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got his deer-in-the-headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot but that was my thought process, and what happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it, but before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three now, right? I looked at him, horrified. I had him completely blocked from all my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now or that I was married and I was not friends with anyone who knew them, but he knew. How's your husband doing too? He asked when I didn't answer. He's good, he's good man, I said trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Really? Where does he work? At this point, I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully, another employee approached just to gather some reshelves and I got out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me. I'll see you again. We'll talk. We'll go out and do something together. We will. I reported him to the managers telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information he had on me and my family that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV, while I had not heard anything, I'm guessing one of them finally managed to approach him because I hadn't seen him since. This has been going on for 10 years and I want it to finally be over. If he shows up again, I'm going to call the police, but I'm seriously hoping it never comes to that. I just want him to stop. A couple of years ago I spent most of my time skating. I didn't have many friends I could skate with so I was always on the lookout for new friends to skate with. There was this really friendly guy at the skate park who seemed really motivated on making new friends and making somewhat of a skate crew. He was really motivated on getting skate clips and photos to put on social media. We got along and he was really friendly so I figured why not network with a new friend to skate with. I gave him my number and he seemed perfectly normal at first. He hit me up a few days later and I picked him up and we skated. The whole time he still was completely normal and cool, nothing suspicious or strange at all. I dropped him off and everything was chill. A couple of days later while I'm at school he texts me asking if I wanted to skate. I was busy and didn't reply. Within an hour he sends me multiple texts saying something like, why aren't you answering me? What did I do? And I'm sorry. I said screw it and that night asked him to skate. 
I know that sounds really stupid, but I thought maybe just on my previous interaction that he was on some sort of spectrum of autism. Even though this may have seemed like a sketchy decision to hang out with him, the whole time we hung out he was completely normal. He was the same friendly, motivated guy I met. However, after I dropped him off, things got worse. A few days later the same thing happened where he texted me, I got busy, and he blew up because I didn't respond to him. However, this time I didn't reply at all that day or night, and this set him off even more. He sent me hundreds of texts over the next week going from aggressively clingy, as seen before, I guess that's the way to describe it, to completely delusional. We met when I was 19, but he texted me delusional crap saying, remember when we were kids and you'd come over and we'd hang out? You'd have your shirt off and we'd play. I felt sorry for this guy. I knew he was a good guy with a good heart, but he just suffered from serious mental illness it seemed. I just wish he had more people in his life who could help him control his issues. Later he started calling me over and over again. I have hundreds of voicemails from him and the creepiest thing about the voicemails is that they are all silent. He would call on my phone and just sit there silently, leaving voicemails where I could hear him breathing or hear a fan in the background. This went on initially for a few months. I thought he lost my number or forgot about me, but then a few more months after this all died down he started calling again but under an unknown number so I couldn't block him. This happened off and on for about a year. There was one incident where someone came to the house, went through our gate, vandalized our front yard. We're not sure if it was him or not, but after that we installed cameras. That was the worst it got. Mostly he called on and off for a year. There was one instance where he used his mom's phone. I believe it was his mom's phone because the text read, This is Justin's mom. Justin wants to know why you won't talk to him. Back before he started calling under unknown again. I replied to the text asking if Justin was okay and saying he needed help. Then he texted me from his phone saying, don't bother my mom. This cooled down after about a year ago. I'm not sure what happened to him, but I hope he got the help he needs and is doing okay. The story starts off with my sister in 8th grade and continues to this day. So when I say long, I mean long. My sister Diana is six years younger than me, and the first to be born in the United States as I immigrated to the USA with my family when I was two years old. When she was in eighth grade, I was in college, but due to how close my family is, it wasn't uncommon for me to visit them often and talk on the phone, so the things to come I didn't personally witness, but were relayed to me by my mother, father, or sister. No. My sister has always been one of those pretty girls who has always thrived on male attention. Even at that young age, she was always very aware of how she looked, how boys looked at her, and that she wanted a boyfriend. Well, that boyfriend came in the form of a freshman in high school named Elliot. It wasn't that unusual for there to be a year or two difference in relationships in my area. Even I had a freshman boyfriend when I was in 8th grade, so when my sister locked her eyes on him, she got a bit obsessed with the idea of being with him most likely due to the fact that he was in high school and she was in middle school, and Elliot didn't want to go out with Diana. He did, however, keep her on the hook, which really messed with her mental state. Young, hormonal, and suffering, what we know now as manic depression, it mattered so much to her what people, especially boys, thought of her, so he'd give her just enough attention in the form of phone calls, meeting in her friend's neighborhood where he too lived, and so on to keep her infatuated with him, but didn't go out with her. This might seem like no big deal, but it really ate away at my sister's self-esteem and sanity. She started cutting, sneaking out, becoming a really aggressive person towards my family and so on. Sure, honestly, part of it was because she was spoiled, but she was also a very young and unstable person. We tried incredibly hard to keep the two apart. We didn't trust her going to her friend's house because we knew she'd just sneak out at night to visit Elliot a few houses down but she clung onto the hope that they would one day be together, and well, when she got into high school, exactly that happened. Pretty much the moment she was no longer officially a middle schooler, Elliot asked my sister out. My father didn't like him due to the suffering my sister put herself through pining for him. I didn't like him due to the fact that he kept her on the hook until she was just old enough to be acceptable for his reputation, but my sister would hear nothing of our warnings, and my mother, foolishly she admits now, 
encouraged the relationship in hopes that now they were finally together, the emotional struggle would die down and my sister would be easier to deal with. Well, this relationship started off as many do, even at that young age, with a happy-go-lucky honeymoon period where she loved him and he loved her and everything seemed to be doing fine. But it wasn't long before we started noticing some possessive behavior from Elliot, some subtle manipulation tactics. Diana has always had male friends. She's naturally pretty and bubbly, so she often, still to this day, tends to accidentally anger her female friends. But male friends usually aren't as catty, so she's always gravitated to male friends. Well, that's where it started. Elliot started developing a really crappy attitude whenever she hung out with her male friends, even if he was invited to go along. Eventually, it became easier for Diana to just not hang out with her male friends to avoid the argument and terrible attitude of Elliot, and so she lost a lot of her male friends. This eventually escalated to him calling her terrible names and asking, did you sleep with him, whenever she talked to the few male friends she had left at school during passing times in the hallway. It ended with her not having any male friends at all. This eventually also trickled down to female friends. He didn't like when her female friends had boyfriends and Diana would hang out with them. He didn't like when her female friends took her out places like the movies because, you know, she might meet another guy there. And eventually he started calling her friends sluts and whores for the way they dressed and acted and told Diana that if she hung out with them, she must be one too. They had quite the volatile relationship. You could often hear them yelling at each other over the phone when she locked herself in her room. You would hear stories about how he would nearly beat the crap out of certain guys at school for talking to her and during their first breakup periods, which happened frequently, he would be downright verbally abusive and threatening, calling her fat, garbage, a whore and so on. She also claimed on a couple of occasions that he had physically harmed her, not hit her, but shoved her against walls and stuff like that. Needless to say, that made me pretty irate, but I couldn't convince her to break up with him, none of us could, and whenever we tried to block contact, they would just find a way to go around the rules. It was almost impossible to keep them apart despite his abusive behavior, and at the end of the day, even if we banished her from going over to his house and took away all forms of technology, they still went to the same school. It was impossible to keep them apart without her moving schools, which she was not at all willing to do and my parents didn't push. At this time, my father and I were done with this piece of crap and told Diana at any opportunity that he wasn't good for her. My mother, unfortunately, was also being manipulated by him. She never had a son, and while it's not a really good excuse, I can understand how she might have felt a soft spot for him. After all, we didn't see this behavior. We just heard about it from Diana and others. My mother was under the impression that Diana was being a bit overdramatic about her claims, which isn't unlike my sister. She had a bit of a chronic lying problem at this point in time, and she also had sort of become an emotional support for Elliot, who didn't have a good relationship with his own family. But looking back, even she admits that she was probably just being manipulated by him. And so this relationship went on way longer than it should have. College prep time comes around and my sister, like many foolish young people, decides to base her future education on what Elliot was doing. He was attending a private college, being a year ahead of her on a wrestling scholarship, and she had applied and gotten accepted into a public university within miles of his school. All they had to do was survive that year before she graduated high school and they would be practically attending college together. Well, the year that he was at college and she was still at high school was an absolute mess that would slowly and thankfully start to lead to the end of their relationship. He had started to hang out with these two girls at his university. For some reason, they liked to pick on my little sister and deliberately make her worry that Elliot was doing stuff with them behind Diana's back. Whenever she confronted Elliot about this, he would pull the whole, oh you know I'd never do that, kind of excuse. Well, one incident sticks out in my mind in regards to these girls and his relationship with them. I was home for the holidays and I knocked on my sister's door to talk to her for some reason or another. When I go into the room, she is collapsed on her floor sobbing. And I'm not talking about spoiled princess tantrum sobbing. I'm talking about kneeling, clutching her stomach because she felt like she was in physical pain from sadness type of sobbing. I asked her what was wrong and she told me she had called Elliot and the girl had answered the phone, implying that the girl was in his room late in the evening. She was devastated. We thought this would be the end of it, but it wasn't. 
he ended up spinning some story about how the girl was helping him with homework and he was in the bathroom when she answered the phone. She bought it and the relationship continued. Incidents with these girls and Elliot became a regular occurrence. Things would seem fine, then either Elliot or these girls would text her, post on social media, or do things that would make her question his loyalty. Then he would give her some sob story and she'd take him back. It was as if he was purposely using these girls to torment my little sister, was getting off on it, and it was disgusting. We ended up presenting all the evidence to the soccer coach of the girls picking on my sister as they were at the school on a soccer scholarship, just to see if we could put an end to it. Well, it did, at least in regards to the girls. The coach threatened to kick them off the team and take away their sports scholarship because, obviously, harassing some high schooler isn't very sportsmanlike. Around this time, Diana broke up with Elliot and, for a while, it seemed like it was over. Well, manipulators rarely let things go, so it wasn't long before he was in contact with her, begging for her to take him back. He even dropped out of college and moved back home to our hometown to prove that he didn't want anything to do with those girls. But it wasn't really the same again, not for Diana. They went out for a while on and off again, and we had to witness more of his terrible, your mind possessive nature. That was until she went to college. My parents were not about to let her blow off college just because Elliot decided to drop out and move back to her hometown, so she went off to college. He around this time enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. I'm not sure why he had did this, because his entire teenage life he had been about keeping Diana close and being shipped off somewhere far away is no good way to do that, but I can only assume it was to one day trap my sister in a state away from her family. Because while my mother was still, for some reason, in love with this kid, my dad and I hated him, and I'm sure he knew that. I'm not even joking about how much we hated him. As an example, my sister asked my dad if he would give his blessing if they got married, and my dad said he wouldn't even attend the wedding. Anyway, she was off to college and he was in the Marines, and then things got really serious. While Diana was at college and she got that taste of social freedom she had never had before, she actually got to go to parties, hang out with friends, and being around men who, while immature, were not complete a-holes and actually knew how to respect women. He didn't like this, and his text and verbal abuse became more frequent. She didn't stop though. I mean, how could he enforce things all the way out in California? Well, she decided to visit him during this time, and I have to say I'm honestly surprised my sister came back. I was almost certain he'd either pop the question or harm her in some way, preventing her return. He did ask her to marry him, but she told him she wanted to wait until he was done with his enlistment due to her not wanting to move away from her home state. Well, she came back to us in good spirits. Apart from turning down his proposal, they had had a good time. Well, apparently it hadn't all set well with him because his harassment of her became downright insane after this. There's this little thing called the Marine Ball, where soldiers take someone special to a huge dance type event. Think prom, but on steroids. Diana had wanted to go, but mom said no, as she had already paid for the first trip mentioned previously, so my sister had to say no. Well, he ended up taking another woman instead, rather than going alone like any other decent man in love would, and posting the events of the evening in shameless detail all over social media. Needless to say, this crushed my sister, and was at last the final straw for her. They broke up. He was in California, she was home with us, and we thought, finally, this must be it, it's done. Well, of course, it wasn't. After this breakup, my sister went into full swing self-destruction. She didn't go to her college classes, she partied all the time, she blew through the money saved up for her for emergencies, and something really bad happened. I will not get into the grisly details because even in a state of anonymity, it's not my business to release those details and it sickens me to think about it, but basically at one of the parties, she was drugged, and you can kind of guess where things go from there. She kept it from me for years, but my mother knew, and so did Elliot. He had been trying quite religiously, I might add, to get her back since she broke up with him, so in a state of total devastation and mental insecurity, she told him, probably in hopes that he would comfort her and tell her he loved her and the sorts of things guys who actually care would do. Well, he didn't do that. Instead, he called her a whore and told her she probably asked for it, that it was her fault somehow, and how she probably lied about it and that she willingly did it. This obviously messed her up mentally. 
One of the people in the world she loved the most, despite the hell he had put her through these years, shoved her tragedy back in her face and told her it was her fault. What sort of man does that? That was the actual final straw. She never spoke to him again after that. The damage had been done though. After going through what she did in regards to being drugged, losing the man she loved, even if he was an a-hole, because he decided to victim blame her, it couldn't have been easy and she had a really rough time. She was still deeply in love with him, but she finally could see what type of man he really was. A monster. Unfortunately, she ended up dropping out of college. However, she did get a certification a few years later in a trade and is now living a pretty successful life, but the creepy behavior and stalking didn't stop. In retaliation, Elliot married a 19-year-old girl who looked almost identical to my sister within one month of meeting her. Then it got that girl knocked up within a month. In just under a year, he had a kid and a wife all despite my sister, and trust me, it hurt her plenty. Diana might have finally put an end to a cycle of manipulation and abuse, but somewhere deep down she still loved that monster of a man. He even sent her a text saying, I'm going to name my baby girl after you, or I'm going to name my baby girl what we wanted to name our baby girl, just to mess with her. He was a real psycho. Well, I don't know what sort of reaction he was hoping for from that, but he didn't get it. Instead, she stopped responding to him, blocked him on social media, blocked his phone, and so on. He kept calling and texting and trying to add her on Facebook, Twitter, so she eventually sent a message on Facebook to his wife telling her what he had been doing and the history of their relationship and his stalking behavior. The poor woman he tricked into marrying him is still with him, but for a while the harassment stopped after that. It didn't stop entirely, though. Still to this day, she gets the worst type of text messages from anonymous number services this time, calling her terrible names, saying she asked to have what happened done to her, saying the most horribly vulgar things about her that I'll never repeat. Every now and then, she'll shoot another message to his wife to try to get it to stop, but at this point, we think he has admin control over his wife's account and somehow gets to and deletes those messages before his wife can see them. That, or his wife is just as insane as he is and enjoys torturing my sister, but I honestly doubt that. I think she's an unfortunate pawn in this horrible cycle of abuse. This man is dangerous. It never escalated to beatings or worse with my sister, but I do not doubt for a moment that had my sister agreed to his proposal that she would be in California, stuck at home with a kid at 18 and 19 years old, away from all her family and in a verbally and physically abusive relationship, the things he has texted her anonymously have been violent, sexually and otherwise, and despite how rigorous the military's psych evaluations are supposed to be, he somehow managed to slip through the cracks and now has been trained to kill. I don't have a problem with people in the military, I respect our active service members and our veterans, but that man is a dangerous man, obsessive, and now trained in the art of killing. Right now he's in California living with his wife and kid, obsessively sending my sister vile messages but his enlistment is up in a year's time. If he chooses not to re-enlist, he'll return to our state, to our hometown, just five minutes down the road. My biggest fear is that if and when he returns, that he will hurt my sister, or hurt my parents and I to hurt her. I have my own house now. My sister lives with her current boyfriend, who is the complete opposite in every way to Elliot's psychotic personality, but my parents still live at the same house. I wouldn't put it past him to hurt them to hurt Diana. I just hope that he chooses to re-enlist and never steps foot near my parents or sister again. My sister just wants to move on. We all do. My mother has long ago accepted her part as enabler of their relationship, and she was very wrong. And while she does say she was manipulated, she takes full ownership of her part in this and feels horrible about it. She told him on one of his last attempts to reach out to the family that he is to, on no certain terms, message her again or come to the house and so far, he has listened to her for now. Whenever he's out on leave and back home, I'm scared I'll go over to my parents' house one day and find something terrible. I'm afraid that he'll use whatever military abilities he has to find my sister and do something horrible to her and her boyfriend. My sister has never contacted the police over any of the events that have happened in this story. While she hates him now, she doesn't want to do anything to hurt his wife or kid so she won't contact the Marine Corps in regards to his stalking. She also won't call the police, mostly because she just wants it to be done with and would rather ignore him completely at this point. 
I hope a stalking stops or that she finally has enough and does contact the authorities, but right now we're all just sort of in a state of anticipation, waiting to see whether he'll stay in the Marines or not. But Elliot, I know it's very unlikely that you would hear this and recognize this story as you, but you are a very sick man. Your jealousy, verbal abuse, stalking tendencies, and capability of physical abuse will land you in prison one day. I just hope it isn't for hurting my family. Because, Elliot, I will not let you get away with hurting my family. You better be the one who's hoping we don't meet again. Because if you show up at my parents' house, I will not hesitate in calling the police and defending them and myself. Growing up, I had a pretty great childhood. Before my parents divorced, I lived in a big, old house with tons of backyard space and a brand new in-ground pool. I was the middle daughter of only two brothers at the time, so we had your typical suburban nuclear family setup going on. My street had a lot of different kind of people living on it, but my house was one of the only ones with a family in it, meaning the house next door was an elderly couple with a whole bunch of dogs, and the house across the street was another elderly couple who loved pranking me and my older brother. They were awesome, to be honest. Next to them lived the guy this story is about, Mike. Mike was a secluded guy. He lived alone and we only ever saw him when he was walking his dog or taking out the trash, which was weird. Most people on my street knew each other very well, but no one really knew this Mike guy. I hardly ever saw lights on in his house, and from what my older brother remembers, he was never really out and about like everyone else on our street. And it's not like he wasn't home because his really nice Jeep Wrangler was always parked in his tiny driveway unless he was at work. One night, I was in our dining room with my parents playing some type of board game and there's a knock at the door. This neighborhood was not rough by any means, so my parents usually kept our door unlocked until they went to bed and rarely ever denied opening the door to anyone. My dad noticed it was Mike and immediately opened the door, being a friendly neighbor and inviting him in for a beer even though we had never really socialized with him before. So Mike sits down and I remember sitting across from him, next to my dad and being super shy and awkward because, honestly, this guy always gave me the creeps. He proceeds to tell my parents that he knew my mom worked for a home remodeling company. This isn't weird for him to know. My mom's company car had the logo plastered all over it and was always parked in our driveway, and he wanted to know what her prices were, etc. So... My mom starts giving him the sales pitch, and I got bored of the adult conversation and leave to watch my brother play his Tony Hawk skateboarding game on his Xbox. Mike ends up staying for probably around an hour and ends up leaving with a friendly handshake and a thanks for the beer, yada yada. My mom and dad exchange confused glances once they shut the door behind him, and my dad made a comment about how that was super random and the guy kinda has a weird vibe about him but both he and my mom played it off as him being a loner and not having the best set of social skills. After this encounter, my mom started seeing Mike everywhere, and I mean everywhere. This was a big jump from before, when we would see him literally nowhere besides in front of his house or walking his dog, and it's not even like it's one of those things like when you buy a new car and suddenly every other car you see out driving is the same as yours. I live in a pretty tight-knit community in a small town, and it's hard to go out without seeing someone you know, and everyone is always super friendly and says hello, even if they don't know each other well. My point being, if my mom had ever seen Mike in public before, she would have remembered. It started off as her seeing him in common places like the grocery store, Target, gas stations, or the occasional trip to the bank. Then as the weeks went on, she noticed that every time she would pull out of her driveway to leave to go somewhere, his red jeep would immediately follow, like he was waiting for her to leave, and then would just jump in his car and follow. She even noticed him in the parking lot of her work one time. She knew it was him because of the bumper stickers he had. Things got really weird when he would start coming up to my mom while she was smoking on her porch or just sitting out there reading. He would have really uncomfortable conversations with her, the kind where the person you're talking to is just so socially awkward that holding a conversation with them is physically painful and you just want them to leave. This happened about twice a week and my mom was starting to get really sketched out by his behavior. I think her breaking point was one day when she was at the gym and he showed up. He had followed her there before and she would always see him there using one of the machines behind her and could feel him staring at her the whole time. Anyway, this time he showed up about 45 minutes into her usual one hour workout. 
so he got onto the machine behind her and was there for the last part of her routine. When she got up to leave, he followed her. Fifteen minutes into his workout, he just decided to get up and leave the exact same time my mom did. Not normal. She even took a super weird out of the way route home to affirm her suspicion that he was following her, and sure enough, he was behind her the whole time. She was fed up. She came back super freaked out and told my dad that the next time he pulled this crap, she was going to confront him and hopefully scare him off. Fast forward a few weeks after this incident and things had died down almost completely. My mom started to think that he had moved on to something else or had realized that he was being a total weirdo. One night, I woke up late at night and went to the kitchen to get a drink of water. It must have been at least midnight, late for a ten-year-old because my parents were asleep and the only light on in the house was a small lamp we kept on top of our piano in the dining room. To get from my bedroom to the kitchen, I had to walk through the dining room, the same one that looked out to our front porch and faced Mike's house across the street. I should mention that there is also a huge bay window on the same side of the dining room that is facing the street, so on my way through the dining room, I looked to my left just to take a peek outside. What I saw... I will never forget. It was Mike, just sitting on our porch on one of our chairs, looking to my house through the huge bay window. We both realized we saw each other at the same time, and his eyes got huge and he sprang up and sprinted back across the street to his house. I was so terrified that I never even told my parents. I know, that's dumb, but I was only ten and was afraid my parents of not believing me, or worse, than believing me and then my dad going over there and seriously messing Mike up. I did my best just to forget about it. From then on, he never bothered my mom and my parents ended up divorcing about two years later and we moved out of that house. And he never got his house remodeled either. Even though I don't live there anymore, I hope I never see Mike again. So this was a couple of years ago when I was in 8th or ninth grade. I had two friends who I'll call Matt and Amy. See, Amy had taken an extreme liking to Matt, like really extreme. Amy would downright attack anyone that so much as bumps into Matt. I don't know if it was just an obsessive crush or something, but it really made everyone in our friend group uncomfortable. Matt is a sweet guy, so he didn't really judge her about it, but he would always talk about how annoyed he got when she would get defensive over him. Not even a year of Matt and Amy meeting, things got really strange. Whenever I was hanging out with them, I would notice that Amy would stare at me if I ever got too close to Matt or even touched him. I should say at this time that I was starting to figure out that I was a lesbian, so obviously I had no attraction romantically towards Matt and definitely didn't flirt. So I told Matt about this and he told me he was getting annoyed with her acting like that too with everyone else, even his definitely straight male friends. So Matt and I started kind of avoiding Amy and didn't really invite her to hang out, in hopes that she'll give up and go away or something. This was really stupid, but we were like 13 and didn't know how to have serious conversations. A few weeks after we started avoiding her, I was starting to get like a lot of emails for inappropriate websites in my school email, which is like panic inducing for me because I use that email for all school related things, like opening up presentations. In the end, I created a new email for all my school stuff which was a big hassle because I had to transfer every file over. Nothing happened for a while until I started getting anonymous threats and really inappropriate things in my Facebook inbox. This doesn't sound that bad but I was 13 and one of the messages was talking about brutally killing my pets while describing how to get into my backyard. This was super creepy and I told Matt about it and he was saying he was getting weird messages too. He said that he was first sent love poems and songs and stories about him. He told the person to knock it off or he'll call the cops, which was a bluff. It stopped for a bit but started again. This time it was like the person was threatening to hurt themselves and posted pics of hurting themselves to Matt. We were both pretty freaked out by this, yet we were too dumb and didn't tell our parents because we thought we would get into trouble somehow. You know how kids act. The online stuff keeps going on for a few months and gets more and more insane. Matt and I decided we both have to delete our Facebooks because we were getting scared. After we did that, it just all stopped. While we were getting these messages, we didn't see Amy at all. Not at school or just at the local parks, which was odd because it was a small town. One day, Matt and I planned to hang out after school and we were going to walk to his house. 
I left my class and was going to meet up with him under this tree next to the parent pickup. When I was a couple of feet away, I noticed he was talking to someone. I got closer, walking slower than before, and heard that they were arguing. Matt was a quiet, chill guy and I've never heard him yell before. As I got closer, I noticed how Matt was so angry his ears were red and that the person he was talking to was Amy. Amy looked very different too. She looked paler and wore a lot of baggy long clothes even though it was 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I heard Matt say something like, Stop harassing me and my friends. And, You're literally insane. Even though he was screaming at her, she had this really creepy grin. Like when you have a smile for a photo you don't want to take. She says, We haven't talked in so long. I missed you. I couldn't hear her properly and started to walk quickly to Matt because he honestly looked like he was going to swing at her. When I caught up with him, Matt looked relieved and said that we should just go and started quickly towards his house. I looked towards Amy before I left and she didn't have her weird smile anymore. She was full on glaring at me. Her face contorted that it emphasized her eye bags and sunken features. She yelled something at me about my car but after seeing her creepy face, I sprinted towards Matt to ask him what had just happened. Matt was silent, looking down into his hands while he cracked them, a habit he had when he was stressed. I decided not to push it and we forgot about it once we got to his house. I stayed late playing video games at his house and by the time I went to walk home, it was around 6. The sun was starting to set but it would take at least an hour or so to fully set and I knew I could get home before that. I made it home to an empty house, heated up some dinner and fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I finally noticed my cat wasn't in my bed. This was super weird because she always slept with me. I thought maybe she was eating downstairs or something so I go and check her dish and her dinner from last night wasn't even touched. I had this ominous feeling in my stomach that I tried to brush off but couldn't shake. My parents were either sleeping or at work and I made my lunch and ate breakfast and walked the five minutes to my bus. School was chill except that Matt kind of seemed super out of it. After my algebra class, he said he had to talk to me after school and said to meet at the tree again. I was weirded out but said alright. I also asked him if he had seen my cat because she was known to wander around the neighborhood before we headed our separate classes and he kind of just turned pale and shrugged it off. To be honest, I was annoyed that he didn't take it seriously and just went to class. School ends and I meet up with him and said that he knew where my cat was. I was kind of annoyed at this point because I straight up asked him about it and he didn't say anything initially but I just wanted the info on my cat. I asked him where she was and he looked really uncomfortable. He pulled out his iPod touch and showed me a gory picture of a cut off cat's tail with a bloody note and collar with a cat's name tag. I started crying because he started saying he found this at his backyard door and the note said something about Matt cheating on them and this was their revenge. Matt said he was sorry and something else but I was kind of zoning out at this point. I only came back to focus when he started talking about Amy and that she must have done this. He explained the conversation they had prior and that he found out she was the one sending the weird crap to him and his other friends who apparently were getting stalked as well. He said that Amy was talking about how I was apparently Matt's girlfriend and that she was going to get revenge on me. I remember that the day I went over to Matt's house she said something about my cat. At this point we were both really creeped out. We went over to my house that day and couldn't help but look out my window for Amy. After a week we noticed that we didn't see Amy again. We even asked around if anyone else had seen her and they all said they noticed she wasn't there except for this girl who I didn't really know well. She said that Amy moved to another state. Matt and I were surprised at this and asked why. She said she didn't know but that Amy was super angry about it. At this point, all contact with Amy and me was severed and I never saw her again but Matt would receive love letters signed by no one for another year. I stopped talking with Matt now. We kind of drifted so I don't know if he was still getting the letters but all I know is that Amy, if you're still roaming the plains wherein I reside, be ready, because I'm coming for you. I'm going to try my best to keep the anonymity of my location since this happened in my relatively small hometown, but I will be sure to include all the important details. When I was 15 years old, I got my first real job, as in not babysitting, at a local restaurant in my town. I worked there up until I was about 17. 
I was a close family friend with one of the assistant managers. She was basically like a second mom to me, and so she always made sure I was well taken care of at this place. The restaurant I worked at had a reputation for being kind of a dive, but did attract a lot of locals, regulars, and people visiting from out of town. So, we were relatively busy every night. Now, I've had my fair share of experiences with creepy old men hitting me in the years I worked there. Normally, they were tourists just coming through for the night, but there were a few regulars I had to stay away from. But this story isn't about them. This story is about one of my co-workers. Now, if you know anything about service industries or have worked in one before, you know that supervisors don't necessarily hire the best people to work in the back of the house, food prep, dishwashers, etc., Usually these people are the ones who don't necessarily have the best past, but are willing to work for cheap so they get hired anyway. Well, the restaurant I was working at did not normally perform background checks before hiring, so the back of the house was basically filled with a bunch of pervy middle-aged stoners who did a great job at making me feel uncomfortable from time to time. I always learned to put up with it though. The last summer I worked there, they hired a guy named Nick. Keep in mind, I'm only 5'2", and at the time they hired him, I was only 16 years old. Nick was about 6'7", all muscular, and had a face that you could immediately tell he wasn't someone you wanted to encounter in a dark alley. He was probably in his mid-30s, but drugs had made his face age a lot quicker. Apparently he had a bad pass with drugs, also evident by how strung out he always looked, and he had been in an underground MMA ring prior to being hired where I work. So basically the second I saw him, I knew this was a guy I didn't want to get to know. Fast forward a few weeks and things start inevitably being weird with him. Keep in mind, I was one of the only women who worked there who wasn't at least in her 30s and I was required to wear waitressing pants which tend to show off my figure. This was the main reason why I always attracted attention from the lonely drug addicts that work there. So Nick eventually followed their lead. It started off with the stairs when I walked by. The ones that were way too long held and more menacing than the typical ones I would get from the guys in the back. Then it became him following me into back rooms, just to stare and not say a word, but give me a weird smirk when I would turn around and notice him standing there, just watching me. This continued for about a month until he really began to gain confidence. He would approach me from behind while I was alone and whisper extremely inappropriate things in my ear, and then laugh when I would tell him to screw off and leave me alone. And before you ask, yes, I did tell my manager, but the only one who took me seriously was the one who had hired me in the first place, and she wasn't in charge of the employees in the back. So basically anything she told them to do, they didn't have to listen because they were under her supervision, and the manager that was considered their boss was one of the ones who would harass me as well. This manager actually made up a nickname for me, alluding to my butt, and this comes into context later. I won't repeat it, but just know that it was gross. So at this point, I was helpless. I needed the job and money because I have seven siblings and wanted to provide for myself as much as I could, and this was the only place close enough to my house that my parents could give me a ride. I didn't drive myself yet. So as the months went on, Nick became more and more infatuated with me. I had guy friends that worked there tell me how he was always asking personal questions about me, like where I go to school, if I had a boyfriend, even asking where the house was because he knew I lived close to the restaurant. I used to change at work before I left if I had any plans after, and once I had found that my bag with my change of clothes had been gone through, and the only thing missing was one of my bras that I had planned to change into to go out that night, I can only assume it was Nick who took it. My breaking point finally happened when he ended up groping me while I was reaching a high shelf. I immediately broke down in tears and went to my best friend, Kai, who agreed that this was enough. I had always been seen as everyone's little sister there. Most of the older guys who worked as servers or hosts would make sure to keep me away from the creeps, and if anyone messed with me, they had something to say. Basically, Kai cursed Nick out and told him to leave me alone, and from then on, I wouldn't go into the back of the restroom without Kai or another male co-worker with me. This is what eventually caused Nick to lose interest in me, or so I thought. I should also note the situation that made me fear this Nick guy as much as I do today. A few weeks before I quit, I was working the closing shift. It was myself, Kai, the family friend manager, a few other guys, and Nick on the closing crew. Our manager is the sweetest woman on earth and is always seeing the best in people. So for the past few weeks she had been giving Nick small amounts of cash to pay for the bus, supposedly. But that night, 
She finally told him that she had to stop giving him money because she knew he was probably buying drugs and she could lose her job. Nick completely lost it. He started screaming and towering over her, calling her disgusting names and throwing papers and anything else he could find on her desk. I heard the commotion and as I was in the next room over and walked out just as Nick flung her office door open in a fit of rage. He glared at me with so much hate in his eyes and told me that if I told anyone what I saw, I would regret it. He was obviously high, but his violence and tone scared the living crap out of me. I walked into the office to see my manager sobbing, begging me not to leave her alone with him. So I stayed and she gave me a ride home, thanking me for being there at the right time. This is when I knew how unpredictable and violent this guy really was. I ended up quitting my job at that place once I got my driver's license and could look elsewhere which was about five months after they initially hired Nick. I got my new job as a barista at a local cafe and had worked there for almost two months, pretty much never thinking about my old job or creepy Nick ever again. Until one night, I was walking into my new job. My shift started at 6pm but it was late December so it was already completely dark outside. My new job was in a complex with a few other stores but the parking lot was very dimly lit and it was a rainy night which made the whole place even more eerie. As I'm walking in from my car, I see a figure in the single streetlight near the end of the lot where my job's part of the building was. I immediately froze. I could have recognized that silhouette anywhere. It was Nick, and he was just standing there, in the middle of the pathway from the car to the door of my job, facing me. I knew he saw me because even in the dim light I could see the disgusting smirk on his face. Now from what I knew before, Nick had his driver's license revoked and had always caught rides or took the bus home from work at my old job, so I don't know how he got here. It's also important to note that my job was on the end of the strip of stores, and beyond it was nothing but the place where the dumpsters are, so it was very odd for him to be standing there without the intent of going in my store. All these thoughts were going through my mind as I was standing in the parking lot, staring down this guy who had tormented me for months, threatened me too. I immediately became anxiety ridden but tried to play it off like I didn't recognize him. As I walked by him though, he said, I finally found you again. So, I sprinted the last few feet in the cafe and proceeded to go to the bathroom and have an anxiety attack, calling Kai for the first time in months and telling him everything that had just happened. Since then, he had been coming into my work sporadically and every time he does, I become extremely flustered and find every excuse to get out of there. He'll ask for me or make eye contact and wink at me from across the lobby. I eventually told my current manager about my past with this guy, so every time he comes in, and he is easily recognizable, my manager conveniently sends me to the back. I'm so thankful to work in a place that actually cares about me now and doesn't tolerate any sexual assault or harassment like I've experienced at my first job. I hate the fact that I had to go through that from the young age of 16 but it definitely helped me grow up a lot and learn to defend myself. I just want to send the message to all the young women that if you are in a situation where someone is treating you like this, you don't have to put up with it. Get yourself out. Do what's best for you. Nothing is worth living in fear. You are worth more than that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you enjoy these videos and wish to support the channel further and receive early access to all future narrations before they go up on YouTube, please consider supporting on Patreon for $1 or more a month. Also be sure to check out shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash let's read for channel t-shirts and merch. Also the channel will be breaking back into countdown, analysis, and documentary style videos again soon, so if you're a scriptwriter and or video editor, Please be sure to contact me via email or Twitter to discuss potential opportunities. Thanks so much, and I'll see you again soon.